Hello everyone, and welcome back to Wiki Whisperer, Articles Aloud. My name is Adrian Kuro, and I will be your host. Now, this is a show where I select a Wikipedia article at random, or by request, by emailing me at wikiwhisperer at gmail.com, spelled W-I-K-I-W-H-I-S-P-E-R-E-R at gmail.com and I read that Wikipedia article in its entirety. Now to keep with the spirit of authenticity, as if I was truly reading to you, I have decided to do this show in one take. No cuts, no edits. That means all stutters, misspoken words, and errors will be kept in, which I apologize for in advance. Today's article is about Emperor Norton. The first and only Emperor of the United States. Let's begin. Joshua Abraham Norton, circa 1818 to January 8, 1880, was a resident of San Francisco, California, who in 1859 proclaimed himself Norton I, Emperor of the United States, commonly known as Emperor Norton. In 1863, after Napoleon III invaded Mexico, he took the secondary title of Protector of Mexico. Norton was born in England, but spent most of his early life in South Africa. Leaving Cape Town, probably in late 1845, he arrived in Boston via Liverpool in March 1846 and San Francisco in late 1849. For the first few years, after arriving in San Francisco, Norton made a successful living as a commodities trader and real estate speculator. However, he was financially ruined following a failed bid to corner the rice market during a shortage prompted by a famine in China. He bought a shipload of Peruvian rice at 12 cents per pound, or around 26 cents per kilogram. But more Peruvian ships arrived in port causing the price to drop sharply to 3 cents per pound, or 6.6 .6 pounds per kilogram. He then lost a protracted lawsuit in which he tried to void his rice contract and his local prominence faded. He had a run for Congress in 1858, but was not put on the ballot. However, Norton did not disappear from the scene completely, and he dramatically reset his relationship to the world around him in September 1859 when he proclaimed himself Emperor of the United States. Norton had no formal political power, but was treated deferentially in San Francisco nevertheless, and currency issued in his name was honored in some of the establishments he frequented. Some considered Norton to be insane or eccentric, but residents of San Francisco and the city's larger Northern California orbit enjoyed his imperial presence and took note of his frequent newspaper proclamations. Though Norton received free ferry and train passage and a variety of favors, such as help with rent and free meals from well-placed friends and sympathizers, the city's merchants also capitalized on his notoriety by selling souvenirs bearing his image. On January 8, 1880, Norton collapsed and died before he could be given medical treatment. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, Upwards of 10,000 people lined the streets of San Francisco to pay him homage at his funeral. Norton has been immortalized as the basis of characters in the literature of Mark Twain, Robert Louis Stevenson, Christopher Moore, Morris, Rene Gaschini, Selma Lagerlof, Neil Gaiman, Mircea Cartarescu, and Charles Bukowski. Early Life Norton's parents were John Norton, died 1848, and Sarah Norden, died 1846, who were English Jews. John was a farmer and merchant, and Sarah was a daughter of Abraham Norden and a sister of Benjamin Norden, a successful merchant. The family moved to South Africa in early 1820 as part of a government-backed colonial scheme whose participants came to be known as the 1820 settlers. Most likely, Norton was born in the Kentish town of Deptford, today part of London. 
the best available evidence points to February 4th, 1818 as the date of Norton's birth. Obituaries published in 1880, following Norton's death, offered conflicting information about his date of birth. The second of two obituaries in the San Francisco Chronicle, quote, following the best information obtainable, end quote, cited the silver plate on his coffin, which said he was, quote, aged about 65, end quote, suggesting that 1815 could be the year of his birth. However, Norton's biographer, William Drury, points out that about 65 was based solely on the guess that Norton's landlady offered to the coroner at the inquest following his death. In a 1923 essay published by the California Historical Society, Robert Ernest Cohen claimed that Norton was born on February 4, 1819. However, the passenger lists for the La Belle Alliance the ship that carried Norton and his family from England to South Africa, list him as having been two years old when the ship set sail in February 1820. This information appears not to have been known until after 1934, the year that Norton's headstone was placed at his grave in Colma, California, when Cohen's account remained prominent. This may help to explain why those who had the stone made used 1819 as the birth year. The February 4, 1865 edition of the Daily Alta California newspaper included an item in which the Alta wished Emperor Norton a happy 47th birthday, indicating that his birth date was February 4, 1818, not 1819 as Cohen claimed, a date that would line up with LaBelle Alliance's passenger list from two years later. Moreover, when Cohen quoted the 1865 Alta item in his essay, he used an altered version in an apparent attempt to advance his claim of an 1819 birth date. Persistent claims for an 1819 birth date are of doubtful provenance, tracing to obstantiated assertions made online during the early years of the internet. The Emperor Norton Trust, a non-profit organization, that engages in Norton Research and Education, produced a 2018 bicentennial series, Emperor Norton at 200, that took as its starting point a February 4th, 1818 birth date for Norton. Supporting and participating in the series were a number of institutions that long have helped to preserve the historical record of Emperor Norton. The California Historical Society, the San Francisco Public Library, the Mechanics Institute, and the Society of California Pioneers. There are often repeated historical claims that Joshua Norton arrived at San Francisco on a specific vessel, the Francesca, on November 23, 1849, that he arrived with $40,000 in whole or in part of a quest from his father's estate, and that he parlayed this into a fortune of $250,000 or $9,865,032.05 in 2023 U.S. dollars. None of this is substantiated by contemporaneous documentation. What is known is that, after Norton arrived in San Francisco, he enjoyed a good deal of success in commodities markets and in real estate speculation, and that by late 1852, he was one of the more prosperous, respected citizens of the city. In December 1852, Norton thought he saw a business opportunity when China, facing a severe famine, placed a ban on the export of rice, causing the price of rice in San Francisco to increase from 4 to 36 cents per pound, or 9 to 79 cents per kilogram. When he heard the Glide, which was returning from Peru, was carrying 200,000 pounds, or 91,000 kilograms of rice, he bought the entire shipment for $25,000, or 12.5 cents per pound, hoping to corner the market. Shortly after he signed the contract, several other shiploads of rice arrived from Peru, causing the price of rice to plummet to 3 cents a pound. Norton tried to void the contract, stating the dealer had misled him as to the quality of rice to expect. 
For nearly two years, from early 1853 to late 1854, Norton and the rice dealers were involved in a protracted litigation. Although Norton prevailed in the lower courts, the case reached the Supreme Court of California, which ruled against him in October 1854. Later, the Lucas Turner & Company Bank foreclosed on his real estate holdings in North Beach to pay Norton's debt. He filed for insolvency in August 1856. Norton continued to run newspaper ads selling various commodities. Although these ads appear to have run their course by mid-1857, there are other public traces of Norton during this period. In September 1857, he served on a jury for a case of a man accused of stealing a bar of gold from Wells Fargo and Co. And, in August 1858, Norton ran an ad announcing his candidacy for U.S. Congress. By this time, he was living in reduced circumstances at a working-class boarding house. Reign as Emperor Declaring himself Emperor By 1859, Norton had become completely discontented with what he considered the inadequacies of the legal and political structures of the United States. In July 1859, he issued a brief manifesto addressed to the, quote, citizens of the Union, end quote. It outlined in the broadest terms the national crisis as Joshua saw it, and suggested the imperative for action to address the crisis at the most basic level. The manifesto ran as a paid ad in the San Francisco Daily Evening Bulletin. Two months later, on September 17, 1859, Norton Hand delivered the following letter declaring himself Emperor of these United States to the offices of the Bulletin. Quote, At the preemptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and ten months, past of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself Emperor of these United States, and in virtue of the authority thereby in me vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the Union to assemble in Music Hall of this city on the first day of February next, then and there, to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as may ameliorate the evils under which the country is laboring and thereby cause confidence to exist both at home and abroad in our stability and integrity, nor in the first Emperor of the United States." End quote. The paper printed the letter in that evening's edition for humorous effect, and thus began Norton's whimsical 20-year reign over the United States. Norton issued numerous decrees on matters of state, including a decree on October 12, 1859, to formally abolish the United States Congress. In it, he observed, quote, Fraud and corruption prevent a fair and proper expression of the public vote, that open violation of the laws are constantly occurring, caused by mobs, parties, factions, and undue influence of political sects, that the citizen has not that protection of person and property which he is entitled. End quote. In this same decree, Norton repeated his order that all interested parties assemble at Music Hall in San Francisco in February 1860 to, quote, remedy the evil complained of, end quote. In an imperial decree issued in January 1860, Norton summoned the army to depose the elected officials of the U.S. Congress, quote, whereas a body of men calling themselves the National Congress are now in session in Washington City in violation of our imperial edict of the 12th of October last, declaring the said Congress abolished. Whereas, it is necessary for the repose of our empire that the said decree should be strictly complied with. Now, therefore, we do hereby order and direct Major General Scott, the commander-in-chief of our armies, immediately upon receipt of this, our decree, to proceed with a suitable force and clear the halls of Congress." End quote. 
Norton's orders were ignored by the army, and Congress likewise continued without any formal acknowledgement of the decree. A decree in July 1860 ordered the dissolution of the Republic in favor of a temporary monarchy. Norton issued a mandate in 1862 ordering both the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches to publicly ordain him as, quote, emperor, end quote, hoping to resolve the many disputes that had resulted in the Civil War. Norton then turned his attention to other matters, both political and social. In a proclamation dated August 12, 1869, and published in the San Francisco Daily Herald, he declared the abolition of the Democratic and Republican parties, saying that he was, quote, desirous of allaying the dissensions of party strife now existing within our realm, end quote. The failure to treat Norton's adopted home city with appropriate respect was the subject of a particularly stern edict that often is cited as having been written by Norton in 1872, although evidence is elusive for the authorship, date, or source of this decree. Quote, Whoever, after due and proper warning, shall be heard to utter the abominable word Frisco, which has no linguistic or other warrant, shall be deemed guilty of a high misdemeanor, and shall pay into the imperial treasury as penalty the sum of $25, end quote. Norton was occasionally a visionary, and some of his imperial decrees exhibited profound foresight. He is said to have issued instructions to form a League of Nations. He explicitly forbade any form of conflict between religions or their sects, and he issued several decrees calling for the construction of a suspension bridge or tunnel connecting Oakland and San Francisco. With the last of these decrees showing his irritation at the lack of prompt obedience by the authorities. Quote, Whereas we issued our decree ordering the citizens of San Francisco and Oakland to appropriate funds for the survey of a suspension bridge from Oakland Point via Goat Island, also for a tunnel, and to ascertain which is the best project. And whereas the said citizens have hitherto neglected to notice our said decree, and whereas we are determined our authority shall be fully respected. Now, therefore, we do hereby command the arrest by the army of both the boards of city fathers, if they persist in neglecting our decrees. Given under our royal hand and seal at San Francisco this 17th day of September 1872. Quote. Long after his death, similar structures were built in the form of the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge and the Trans Bay Tube, and there have been efforts since the 1930s to name the Bay Bridge after Emperor Norton, or at least to add Emperor Norton Bridge as an honorary name for the bridge. Norton's Imperial Acts Norton spent most of his daylight hours inspecting the streets, spending time in parks and libraries, and paying visits to newspaper offices and old friends in San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley. In the evenings, he often was seen at political gatherings or at a theatrical or musical performances. He wore an elaborate blue uniform with gold-plated epaulets, at some time given to him second-hand by officers of the United States Army Post at the Presidio of San Francisco. He embellished that with a variety of accoutrements, including a beaver hat decorated with a peacock or ostrich feathers, and a rosette, a walking stick, and an umbrella. In the course of his rounds, he took note of the condition of the sidewalks and cable cars, the state of repair of public property, and the appearance of police officers. He also often had conversations on the issues of the day with those he encountered. Norton, characterist, and would jump, started a rumor that two noted stray dogs named Bummer and Lazarus were Norton's pets. Norton ate at free lunch counters where he shared his meals with the dogs, although he did not, in fact, own them. Special Officer Armand Barbier was part of a local auxiliary force whose members were called policemen, although they were private security guards paid by the neighborhood residents and business owners. 
he arrested Norton in 1867 to commit him to involuntary treatment for a mental disorder. The arrest outraged many citizens and sparked scathing editorials in the newspapers, including the Daily Alta, which wrote, quote, that he had shed no blood, robbed no one, and despoiled no country, which is more than can be said of his fellows in that line, end quote. Police Chief Patrick Crowley ordered Norton released and issued a formal apology on behalf of the police force, and Norton granted an imperial pardon to Barbier. Police officers of San Francisco thereafter saluted him as he passed in the street. Norton did receive some tokens of recognition for his position. The 1870 U.S. Census lists Joshua Norton as 50 years old and residing at 624 Commercial Street with his occupation listed as Emperor. It also notes that he was insane. However, the U.S. Census instructions state, quote, the fact of idiocy will be better determined by the common consent of the neighborhood than by attempting to apply any scientific measure to the weakness of the mind or will, end quote. During the 1860s and 1870s, there were occasional anti-Chinese demonstrations in the poorer districts of San Francisco, and riots took place, sometimes resulting in fatalities. Starting in the late 1870s, those riots were fermented at rallies on Sunday afternoons at the sand lots across from City Hall. The rallies were led by Dennis Kearney, a leader of the anti-Chinese Working Men's Party of California. At a Sandlot rally held on April 28, 1878, Emperor Norton appeared just before the start of the proceedings, stood on a small box, and challenged Kearney directly, telling him and the assembled crowd to disperse and go home. Norton was unsuccessful, but the incident was widely reported in local papers over the next couple of days. Norton issued his own money in the form of scrip or promissory notes which were accepted from him by some restaurants in San Francisco. The notes came in denominations between 50 cents and $10, and the few surviving ones are collector's items that routinely sell for more than $10,000 at auction. Foreign Diplomacy Throughout his reign, Norton commented on the policies and actions of foreign governments, issuing proclamations and sending letters to foreign leaders in attempts to establish congenial and fruitful relations with them and their countries and, if he felt necessary, to cajole better behavior. In 1862, Mexico was invaded by French Emperor Napoleon III after not being able to pay war reparations following the disastrous Reform War. Napoleon installed the Habsburg Maximilian I as his puppet ruler. That news quickly reached the United States, and a man in San Francisco suggested that Emperor Norton take the title, quote, Protector of Mexico, end quote, both because no one had been appointed protector, and because of a popular legend stating Norton was the son of Napoleon III. Norton happily obliged, adding the title to many of his proclamations. But he later would revoke the title, stating, quote, it is impossible to protect such an unsettled nation." End quote. Norton wrote many letters to Queen Victoria, including a suggestion that they marry to strengthen ties between their nations. That proved futile because the Queen never responded. Norton also sent a number of letters to Kamehameha V, the King of Hawaii at the time, regarding an estate in the Kingdom of Hawaii. Near the end of his reign, Kamehameha would refuse to recognize the democratic U.S. government, instead opting to only recognize Norton as sole leader of the United States. Later Years and Death Norton was the subject of many tales. One popular story suggested that he was the son of Emperor Napoleon III, and that his claim of coming from South Africa was a ruse to prevent persecution. Rumors also circulated that Norton was supremely wealthy and was feigning poverty because he was miserly. Starting a few years after Norton declared himself emperor, local newspapers, notably the Daily Alta California, 
began to print fictitious decrees. It is believed that newspaper editors themselves drafted the fake proclamations to suit their own agendas. Weary of that, in January 1871, Norton named the black-owned and operated Pacific Appeal as his, quote, imperial organ, end quote. Between September 1870 and May 1875, the Appeal published some 250 proclamations over the signature of Norton I. Historians and researchers who have studied Norton closely generally regard those proclamations as being authentic. On the evening of January 8, 1880, Norton collapsed on the corner of California Street and DuPont Street, now Grant Avenue, across the street from Old St. Mary's Cathedral, while on his way to a debate at the California Academy of Sciences. His collapse was immediately noticed, and, quote, the police officer on the beat hastened for a carriage to convey him to the city receiving hospital, end quote, according to the next day's obituary in the San Francisco Morning Call. Norton died before a carriage could arrive. The call reported, quote, On the reeking pavement, in the darkness of a moonless night, under the dripping rain, Norton I, by the grace of God, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, departed this life, end quote. Two days later, the San Francisco Chronicle led its article on Norton's funeral with the headline, quote, Le Roy es mort, end quote. Translated as, quote, the king is dead, end quote, and the first half of the traditional proclamation of a new king. It quickly became evident that Norton had died in complete poverty, contrary to rumors of wealth. Five or six dollars in small change was found on his person, and a search of his room at the boarding house on Commercial Street turned up a single gold sovereign worth around two dollars and fifty cents. His possessions included his collection of walking sticks, his rather battered saber, a variety of headgear, including a stovepipe, a derby, a red-laced army cap, and another cap suited to a martial bandmaster. There was an 1828 French franc and a handful of the imperial bonds that he sold to tourists at a fictitious 7% interest. Also found were fake telegrams, purporting to be from Tsar Alexander II of Russia, congratulating Norton on his forthcoming marriage to Queen Victoria, and from the President of France, predicting that such a union would be disastrous to world peace. Also found were his letters to Queen Victoria, and 98 shares of stock in a defunct gold mine. Initial funeral arrangements were for a pauper's coffin of simple redwood. However, members of a San Francisco businessmen's association, the Pacific Club, established a funeral fund that provided for a handsome rosewood casket and arranged a dignified farewell. Norton's funeral on Sunday, January 10th, was solemn, mournful, and large. Paying their respects were members of, quote, all classes from capitalists to the pauper, the clergyman to the pickpocket, well-dressed ladies, and those who garb and bearing hinted of the social outcast, end quote. The next day, the San Francisco Chronicle reported, under the headline, Le Roy Est Mort, that some 10,000 people had come to view the emperor's body in advance of the 2 p.m. funeral. Notwithstanding the later legend of a, quote, two-mile-long cordage, end quote, the Chronicle reported in the same article that people lined the streets for only the first block or two. The emperor's casket was attended by, quote, only three carriages, end quote, with no mourners on foot, and there were, quote, about 30 people, end quote, at the burial service in the Masonic Cemetery. In 1934, Norton's remains were transferred to a gravesite at Woodlawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Colma, California. In popular culture, details of Norton's life story may have been forgotten, but he has been immortalized in literature. Mark Twain resided in San Francisco during part of Emperor Norton's public life and modeled the character of the king in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn on him. Robert Louis Stevenson 
made Norton a character in his 1892 novel, The Wrecker. Stevenson's stepdaughter, Isabel Osborne, mentioned Norton in her autobiography, This Life I've Loved, stating that he, quote, was a gentle and kindly man and fortunately found himself in the friendliest and most sentimental city in the world. The idea being, let him be emperor if he wants to. San Francisco played the game with him. End quote. In more modern times, the life of Emperor Norton is the inspiration for The Emperor Smith, a Lucky Luke comic book adventure published in 1976. Norton also appears as a character in the comic book The Sandman, Volume 2, Number 31, quote, Three Septembers and a January, end quote, by Neil Gaiman and Sean McManus, and is voiced by John Lithgow in the audiobook version of the comic. He appeared briefly in Captain America Comics number 11. There have been a number of television adaptations of the Norton story. In the June 15, 1956 episode of the Western anthology series Death Valley Days titled Emperor Norton, Parker Garvey played the title character. In the February 27, 1966 episode of the Western television series Bonanza titled The Emperor Norton, Sam Jaff played the title role. The episode also featured William Challey as Sam Clemens, aka Mark Twain. In the December 18, 1956 episode of Broken Arrow, Season 1, Episode 11, titled The Conspirators, Lawrence Ames played the character of Emperor Norton. Since 1974, the Imperial Council of San Francisco has been conducting an annual pilgrimage to Norton's grave in Colma, California, just outside San Francisco. In January 1980, ceremonies were conducted in San Francisco to honor the 100th anniversary of the death of, quote, the one and only Emperor of the United States, end quote. The Emperor Norton Trust, founded and based in San Francisco from 2013 to 2019, and originally known as the Emperor's Bridge Campaign, is a nonprofit that engages in research, education, and advocacy to advance the legacy of Emperor Norton. Emperor Norton is considered a patron saint of Discordianism, and a park in the micronation Malasia is named after him. Public Tributes there have been perennial efforts to name major public San Francisco landmarks after Emperor Norton, or to enact other permanent local tributes to him. Emperor Norton Place Honorary naming of 600 block of Commercial Street The most recent of those efforts has been the most successful. In February 2023, San Francisco Board of Supervisors President Aaron Peskin introduced a resolution to add Emperor Norton Place as a commemorative name for the 600 block of Commercial Street. The resolution was adopted by the supervisors and approved by Mayor London Breed in April 2023, with signage installed in early May. Clock Tower of the San Francisco Ferry Building In October 2022, the Emperor Norton Trust announced a new effort to have the San Francisco Ferry Building Clock Tower named the Emperor Norton Tower, in 2023, the 125th anniversary of the opening of the building in 1898. San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. In 1939, the group E. Clampus Vetus commissioned and dedicated a plaque commemorating Emperor Norton's call for the construction of a suspension bridge between San Francisco and Oakland. The group intended to place the plaque on the recently opened San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, or, failing that, the new Transbay Terminal. However, that was not approved by the bridge authorities, and the plaque was installed at the Cliff House in 1955. It was moved to the Transbay Terminal in 1986, in connection with the 50th anniversary of the bridge. The terminal was closed and demolished in 2010, as part of the project to construct a new Transbay Transit Center, and the plaque was placed in storage. 
After being restored in late 2018, it was rededicated and reinstalled at the new transit center in September 2019, but after being vandalized in 2020, was moved to Malloy's Tavern in Colma, California in 2021. There have been two 21st century campaigns to name all or parts of the Bay Bridge after Emperor Norton. In November 2004, San Francisco District 3 Supervisor Aaron Peskin introduced a resolution to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. After a campaign by San Francisco Chronicle cartoonist Phil Frank called for the entire bridge to be named for Norton. On December 14, 2004, the board approved a modified version of this resolution, calling only for, quote, new additions, end quote, for example, the planned replacement for the bridge's eastern section, to be named the Emperor Norton Bridge. Neither the city of Oakland nor Alameda County passed any similar resolution, so the effort went no further. In June 2013, eight members of the California Assembly and two members of the California Senate introduced a resolution to name the western section of the bridge after former California State Speaker and San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown. In response, there were public efforts seeking to revive the earlier Emperor Norton effort. An online petition, launched in August 2013, called for the entire bridge system to be named after him. The petition was the impetus for the creation of the Emperor's Bridge Campaign, now known as the Emperor Norton Trust, which continued the bridge naming effort until 2022, citing the precedent of 30 California bridges for which the state had authorized multiple names. The trust called on the legislator simply to make Emperor Norton Bridge an honorary name for the Bay Bridge, leaving in place all existing names. More recently, the organization hoped to sponsor a legislative resolution that would take effect in 2022, the 150th anniversary of Emperor Norton's proclamations of 1872, setting out the original version of the bridge. The legislature did not take up the issue in 2022, and the trust suspended its bridge naming effort. And with that, we complete this week's Wikipedia article reading on Emperor Norton, the first and only Emperor of the United States. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please give it a five-star review on whatever podcast directory you may be listening on, as it would help me out a lot. If you have any advice on how I could improve my audio recording and or format, if you would like to request an article for me to read next week, or if you would simply like to give some kind words of encouragement, please feel free to do so by emailing me at wikiwhisperer at gmail.com. That is spelled W-I-K-I-W-H-I-S-P-E-R-E-R at gmail.com. And once again, thank you so very much for tuning in with me for my random Wikipedia article of the week. New episodes come out every Wednesday. I do hope you enjoyed, and have a wonderful rest of your day.